Hi friends, welcome to the Mobile Bev Pros podcast, a podcast dedicated to providing mobile bar professionals with the information they need to succeed. I'm your host and fellow mobile bar owner, Sarah Murphy. Each episode, I'll be bringing you interviews, knowledge, anecdotes, or opinions with the goal of assisting you in building a profitable, sustainable, and scalable mobile bar business that will support the lifestyle you dream of. I'm excited for today's episode, so let's get started. Today on the podcast, I'm here with Bobby Greenewalt with B&B Beverage Management located in Alabama. But you are not just any beverage catering company. You are one of the largest beverage catering companies in the world or in the country, at least. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we we operate in Alabama as where our bread and butter is. It's where a lot of our uh, business comes from. We also have partnerships with other companies where we will provide our services in different states, specifically like with a, a sporting company, like a tailgate company, where we'll provide those uh, services for tailgates or whether it be uh, Barstool Sports calls us and says, hey, I want to do a tour uh, across seven different sites for football games. And we need to go from L.A. to New York or the this 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 past year we got we had a two day lead time it was a lot of fun we had a two day lead time to put together the best of the best beverage experience at the World Series for the Braves and we had two days to pull it off so I flew in people from L A New York Chicago and Austin for that and that was a that was a whole lot of fun oh my gosh but okay so let's backward engineer this a little bit yeah, when sure. you didn't start there so how how long ago was it that you started B and B and was it just a, a beverage catering, same like uh, bartender slinging drinks at weddings? How did how did you start? Sure. So in 2008, I uh, got out of the Navy and uh, went to Auburn University uh, to finish school there. And while I was there, I needed a job. So I went to a quick little ABC bartending school and uh, started working at a local bar. Once Christmas time came, all the kids left to go home. I wasn't making any money because nobody was at the bar. So I started calling around at different catering companies and, and seeing if anybody needed help. I got hung up on a lot and got a lot of no's. And then I had one lady say, well, I don't need one bartender. I need eight. And so it just clicked in my head. Well, I know eight people who bartend. So let's see what we can do from there. So we coined the name uh, uh, B&B Bartending. And it was not, uh, not not my best name. It was, I was, you know, 21, created the name of a company and, and off we go. And I learned the hard way on how not to do every single thing in business. So uh, so we, that's how we got started. We were just a bartending company. We eventually started learning, hey, we can buy things and rent them and have rentals with it too. And then we really saw the, uh, the feature where if we provide the product itself, then that's where we can make most of our money. That's where the money is because most people don't want to buy the product and then let you serve it. Most people want you to take care of everything from a hospitality standpoint. So we went through the licensing process on that. Every state's different. I could talk about the difference of that for hours, and I'm sure we'll do that at a later time uh, off off the record. But there's there's so many different ways to license in each state. And even in one state, there may be five different ways to license, but you've got to do it the right way. So we legitimized ourselves and, and made sure that we could provide those services. And now we, we provide beverage services and, and even food consultation and, and, and food management services for some of the bigger events as well. Yeah. When you, when you filled out your podcast form, one of the questions is, what are you so well-informed on that you consider yourself an expert and that you could offer you know, insight to the mobile bar community and, and you wrote a paragraph. So I mean, we, we, we don't have uh, the time to go through everything today. So I went through all of the list of things um, and, and mon- many of them are directly applicable to the industry that we're in, including your recent launch of like your cocktail boxes, boxes and your subscription boxes, which is fantastic. And I know that there are a lot of individuals and businesses that pivoted a little bit to that during COVID. I will reiterate for anybody who hasn't followed my advice. If you are in the first two years of your business, I do not recommend adding an additional revenue stream such as subscription boxes because you're still perfecting your main line of business, which is mobile bartending. But if you are beyond that point, then that is always a industry adjacent product line that you could get into. But today I've chosen the topic of festivals, which I'm really excited about. We've never had anyone on the podcast or anybody actually within the NDP ecosystem speak specifically on this, though we do have a number of members of the community that do execute festivals. What I oftentimes get are people who schedule discovery calls. They're just getting started out. A lot of them are in maybe California or Texas, and they get their mobile bar, specifically if it's a larger one, like an Airstream, for example, and they want to get into weddings and festivals. And I always tell them in the the discovery calls that those are 
two vastly different beasts. And my recommendation is to choose one before you move on to the second. And you could do either weddings or festivals. But today we're going to talk a little bit about the beast of festivals. And so if I was a mobile bar and I wanted to get into festivals, where would I start? The first thing you would start with is finding those festivals, finding those concerts. And and I'll use large concerts and festivals hand in hand because it may be a festival is typically multiple artists, but you can have a single act that is the same operational and logistical and planning phase as what a full on festival would be. So find them, right? Find them. And then once you find them, you have to find the ones that are not already tied to a brick and mortar type facility, like an arena or a raceway or whatever it may be, because those typically have uh, some sort of institutional cater that have signed on for a 10 year type lease with them. And they get all these millions of dollars, like your Sodexos and Aramarks and, and Legends, the big boys, right? So with that, once you find the ones that you could potentially do, then you have to attempt to reach out to the right person. If you go to the website, you're going to see like info at uh, welcome to rockville.com, right? So you you can go fill out the food vendor application and it's going to get kicked back because they don't know what you're talking about. And then uh, you can go to the info site. So once you find the right people to talk to, typically there's already a beverage company in place. And so if there is, you can talk to them about potentially working alongside them, whether it be just providing staff or providing additional points of service throughout the facility that they may not be able to accommodate. And even some festivals will have certain types of premium mixology areas that they may not want to deal with because they're they're beer slingers, they're good at the logistics, they're good at putting drinks in people's hands, and they may want to bring in somebody else to help with the VIP areas. So that's that's your first approach. But if you want to do the whole thing, which is something that we really like doing, is just doing the entire beverage program and even food for some of those, is that you just got to find the people in charge. You got to find out when the current company that is there and their contract is leaving and, and, and expiring or coming up for bid again. And then you have to put everything on the table and figure out how much money you want to give them. And if we're talking about a festival, we're talking of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars you'd be giving up to be a player in the game. And it's a it's a scary, scary moment. Like bidding is my least favorite thing to do, but it's also something that we have to do. So bidding on the best possible scenario for a concert organizer who's going to look at you and say, well, they're willing to give us X percent gross or net or whatever it may be. And and some people may say, I'll give you 70% of sales net. Well, 70% net is a completely different story of, set of, of like a 30% or even a 40% growth. So those numbers probably in most instances equal out to be around the same. So it's really just your pitch, your angle. And then if your pitch is too good, then they may also look at you and question, well, why? Why is it so good? Do they really know what they're talking about? And they want to see your history and your track record and see if you can handle it. So there's a lot that goes into it. And that's before we even start talking about the planning, the licensing, the the logistics, the partnering the brands and staffing, which is obviously the biggest problem of, of all events. Right. Like if you're not already getting hives as a mobile bar owner, listening to all of that. <laughs> so on a whim, shortly after I got a partner with a liquor license, when I had my mobile bar, I reached out to the one company that I had a direct contact straight to the CEO and said, Hey, we are liquor licensed now to do uh, catering and events. And I would love to kind of discuss what it would look like for my bar company to be involved in because they don't do, just do one festival, they, they do a number of them all within the Tennessee and Kentucky area. And I he immediately was like, absolutely. Because we had worked with him as a donated event when we were first getting started. Absolutely. We require 80% of net sales. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? What? And I was blown away by this because I didn't realize like that that was just the market because that's not how it works in the private side of things, right? And I was like, this can't be like a standard operating procedure. But sure enough, sure enough, it is. Yeah, it absolutely is. Uh, we we uh, outside of festivals, we have hundreds of partnerships with venues and and other uh, event goers or, or event planners, and and you always want to have your skin in the game, but you always got to give them something. And our typical model is to go on a gross percentage uh, basis, but then we have others that want to do net. And net is honestly the safest bet, especially if you're a, a new mobile bar, you're wanting to go with net because you, you, at the very least your costs are covered, but you get really competitive when you start going into the in a percentage of gross and and uh, it's really attractive to them because these people are doing absolutely nothing. They're covered by your liquor liability insurance. They know that they're, that their guests are enjoying a good experience uh, legally, safely, and and uh, overall good service while sitting back and collecting check. So it's really a great advantage for them, but you also have to compete with yourself. So it's fun. Now, 
I've never been able to ask anybody who knows enough about the laws to answer this question, but you do. So I'm going to ask it. In Tennessee, I know that it is against the alcohol board's policy to split revenue. So I can't you know, say, I'll give you 10% of the sale of alcohol because that would be considered almost like them profiting off the sale of alcohol without a liquor license. However, that's 100% how festivals do it. So how does that work? Is there like a subset to the the code or something that makes that uh, an exception? So it's all about words. And I've learned that a long time. Legal laws in the alcohol community are there to be interpreted. In most instances, they are vague for reasons that the local ABC boards can then interpret them the way and, and make rules and regulations based off those vague rules that's in the best interest for the uh, for the state. And, and the reason being is because most of these laws were passed in the directly after prohibition, right? So they needed to make those laws ambiguous enough to last 100 years, if not longer. And if they become outdated, that's when you go back and change them. So going back to your original question, yes, the the, the wording is where it all comes in. So in some states, you can uh, apply for a, a third-party facilitator license to where like that's somebody like what a Uber Eats or a DoorDash that was going to deliver alcohol would get. So that way they can be paid for a percentage of what they're doing to deliver the alcohol, even though they are not actually processing the sale of the alcohol. So that is a similar situation where in states that allow it, you could do a third-party facilitator type license, but also it's more than just a commission of revenue, right? So you can outline in your contract that you are going to give them a marketing fee of X dollars, or there's different ways to do it. It's very similar to how, I don't know if you know much about the Tide House laws federally with, with the TTB, how Anheuser-Busch cannot come in and say, I want you to sell nothing but Anheuser-Busch at this festival. And uh, you say, okay, that's fine. And they put it in a contract. Now, that will never happen because it is against federal law and there will be millions of dollars in fines. But what they can say is, I'm going to market and I'm going to sponsor this festival and I'm going to be your headliner. I'm going to be the uh, the banner across the stage. And for that, I'd really appreciate it if you served all of our products and these are the products I'd like for you to serve. And then it's on the festival to say, yeah, sure, I'll do that. But they always have the right to serve cores if they want to. So it's it's really just a play on words and how do you make that situation best for you while also being in the confines of the law. That was that was beautiful. And you're you're right. I mean, I'm married to an attorney. It's all all about the words, or as they'd say, it's about the spirit of the words. <laughs> So my next question, which I know that the listeners are really going to benefit greatly from, when I'm planning a wedding, it's an open bar in most cases. And so I have an industry standard calculation as to how much alcohol I should bring based on a number of variables. When it's a festival type situation, that's all out the door, doesn't work. So what is that? What is it? How do you, how do you calculate how much alcohol to bring based on projected head count, you're never quite sure. And and then how much do people actually drink in festival situations? That is an ongoing myth and mystery, something I've been trying to find out for years. And you just start to learn to gauge the first thing that's going to come down to is your audience, right? If you are with a group of 18 to 25 year olds, you're going to sell more water than you're going to sell beer. Uh, just because some of those concert goers may be doing other extracurriculars besides drinking. So when it comes to a country crowd, your country crowd, you are going to sell a ton of beer. A ton of beer is going to be domestic. It's going to be light beer. It's going to be Michelob Ultra. It's going to be Coors Light. And they're going to drink as fast and as much as they can you know, with the cowboy hat on and boots and ready to go. Now, if it's a rock concert, it'll be a little different. It'll be You'll see a little bit more liquor. So it really just depends on your audience, A. Then it depends on your location. Different parts of the country, different parts of the world are going to drink and, and act differently. And then it also depends on the time of year. We did a, uh, we did a music festival, uh, or not, not a music festival, but a, a big uh, country concert in Mobile, Alabama this past year in November, and it was cold. And we sold a lot of beer, but we sold hardly any water, which is a little scary from a responsibility standpoint. And then we do a large music festival in August and sold almost more water than we did beer. Uh, So it really just depends on the climate. So you take those three factors into consideration. Now, each one of those three factors has its own scenario of how much do you buy, how much do you order, and how do you figure it out? I always like to look at it and say, all right, if I am at a concert for eight hours, how many beers would I have? And I would like to say that I'm a average, maybe slightly above average drinker. So I would think I would want to have 
anywhere from six to probably 10 drinks over an eight to 10 hour period, right? Now that sounds like a lot of drinks, but it's almost one an hour when you look at that standpoint. You will have some that will go above that. You'll have some that go below that. And you have some that won't drink at all. So if you use that as a base, then that really helps you. But when you're talking about a festival, it's not like they just say, all right, you've got the job, go out and have fun. Like you are talking to sponsors, you're talking to distributors, you're talking to the manufacturers, and they're all telling you, all right, I want you to, I want you to sell my product. I want you to do this. Can you offer it here? Can we do a specialty cocktail at this bar? And you really have to hone it in. My first year doing, doing a large festival, I was like, yeah, sure, I'll do all those things. Well, all of a sudden, now we're selling 20 SKUs and we can, can barely keep up with the volume of wine because we have eight cocktails we have to make. We're selling six beers and 14 sodas. So it, it really just ended up being more than what we should have done. So now we very, very much so limited to where, from a non-alcoholic standpoint, we limit them to uh, four SKUs, including water. So they get three sodas. From a standpoint on alcohol, beer, you get four SKUs. If it's liquor, each liquor can have one cocktail, like each presenting sponsor, right? So if Diageo comes in, they have Crown and, and uh, Captain Morgan and all these other brands. So they pick one of those brands and one of those brands can have a menu item. Now, those activations, which is a whole different thing we can talk about in a little bit if you want to, but each festival, if you have a big contributing sponsor, is also going to have an activation. And in those activations, they're going to want everything under the sun. And we have to compromise on that. You have to, you have to give them what they want on those activations. But Going back to, I guess, or answer your original question, I kind of went off on a tangent there. There's just a, a lot to it. But you have to work with the distributors, get their opinion, because this may be in an area that you're not familiar with. Find out what the best sellers are. More times than not, they're going to be 100% accurate. And you tell them, all right, based off this, I want to bring in this many pallets of this, this many pallets of this, so on and so forth. And then they bring the trucks and it's there. And you have to then work on your logistics of moving those pallets around, get them to the right bars, and making sure that to make this complication, uh, make it more complicated than what it already is, then you have to then figure out, I just ordered all this beer. Now, which bars do I put them at? Because in the middle of this show, when there's 30,000 people here, I can't get a forklift or a lull to go through the middle of this place with a pallet to drop off more beer. So then there's just a, a larger, larger mix to it from there. Okay. How many years were you in business before you're like, okay, I'm ready for my first festival? I did my first large concert. I did a Kenny Chesney concert in Auburn inside of Jordan Hare Stadium. I was five years into the business and I learned a lot. I was one of three vendors that sold beer at that show. A Sodexo owned the liquor license. We worked as a vendor of Sodexo. So that was the first one I did. And I learned a ton of things there. I bought, I took every little bit of money that we made from that and purchased all of our own equipment to continue doing it. And from there, a year later, we were in business for six years before we got our actual full festival to ourselves. And it was it was a whirlwind. I, I, I mean, looking back on it, I'm like, I don't know how I did that. You know, now we have all these <laughs> checks and balances in place to make sure we're not screwing ourselves over. And uh, and, and then we probably did it 100% the wrong way. But that's that's how business works, especially when you're in a kind of a pioneer of an agency or a, of, a, of a different industry, like like a mobile bar industry. It's, there's not a roadmap to tell you how to do it. And you have to, you have to do it the wrong way before you can learn how to do it the right way, which is why I try to help out as much as I can on, on your Facebook page too, because you want to guide people in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the Facebook page is really made by the OGs that are willing to kind of share the hard-earned knowledge that they've gained uh, throughout their experience. So thank you for, for being yeah. one of those truly valuable contributors. If someone was to come to you and say that they wanted or they had a festival that they would like B&B to do the bar service for. What is your ideal timeline for that? That's, is it, is it like a, you've got to give me at least two weeks. You got to give me at least two months. What does that look for you, like for you? That is a great question. And if you'll allow me a little latitude on it, I want to explain two separate scenarios there. Cause you said when somebody reaches out about a festival and it's, very rare that somebody's going to reach out to me about a festival. It's typically the other way around. I typically go after the big ones. And then the small ones usually reach out to me, which there's nothing wrong with the small ones, but you have to be careful. The small ones will bite you in the butt more times than, they, than, they'll, than they'll be good for you. But the small ones will say, hey, we've got this festival. We're expecting three to 5,000 people. We want to get a percentage of sales. Can you handle the licensing? We have this sponsor. They're donating all this stuff. And then Alcohol donation laws is a whole different topic. We'll do a whole nother episode on that if you want. But then we get into, they say, all right, we want to do this many bars. We want to do this. We want to say, say all these grand things. Well, you've already done a big festival. You understand how all that stuff works and you can do literally anything they want, but it's got to be worth your time, right? You've got to kind of get an idea and gauge what 
is the maximum or at least the minimum amount of revenue I can do at this event. And then it kind of gauge your cost at that point and see, see where you're going to end up. We've done several, what you would call festivals or, or small concerts that have promised to be 10,000 people and 1,800 people show up. And so we staff for it appropriately and it ends up not being worth our time. And, and we lose most of our money on staff because the product is, you know, the product is a product. You know, you, you lose some on the product, then you can get rid of it in other places, uh, depending upon that state's laws. So you have to be careful. You have to be very careful with that. Typically for the smaller ones, if you have to obtain a special event license, you want at least 45 days for a big concert. Like all of our big concerts, we usually have 90 to 160 days. Uh, so, you know, three to three to five months, sometimes even longer. Uh, there's one that we are in a contract with for a multi-year contract deal on it. And we start, it's in August. We start working on it in January. It's just because there's so many steps involved in marketing and sponsorship sales. Because when you do this, you're not just doing it. You're not just out there selling to the masses. You're also uh, selling to everybody that gets a private tent. You're, you're working on all the artists, writers. So, you know, if Kid Rock comes to a concert and he wants... 40 cases of whatever, you've got to get it for them. It's got to be the right thing. And some of those things may be difficult things to find. So you have to plan ahead and, and figure out what you need to do with that. So planning, depending on the size, can be anywhere from 45 days as a best case scenario for a small show, and then up to six months or even longer for the big ones. That makes total sense. Your company has got a number of different uh, revenue streams. And so Tell me a little bit about the mix that goes into your business. Are you 50% festivals, how, like weddings, private events? Are those entirely different kind of operational arms for you? What does that look like if I was to peek behind kind of the org uh, chart for you guys? Sure. So we have three different brands, right? We have our events brand, which is which is what everybody calls B&B uh, Beverage Management. Then we have AMPRO, which stands for American Promotional Marketing. It's our brand ambassador platform where we provide uh, brand ambassadors for liquor brands, beer brands uh, across the Southeast. And then we have Boxdale, which is what you briefly mentioned on, which is our COVID answer to stay in business. It's a non-alcoholic product that is intended for people to use for their alcohol they have at home. And we ship those worldwide now. So those are our three original revenue streams. Now, if you peel back the event side, there are so many different types of events that we do. If we're looking at a quantity type basis, we do around 1,800 events a year. So from a quantity standpoint, we do more weddings than we do anything else. Then for after weddings, it would then go into tailgates and then into supporting events, concerts being last in that. If we're looking at a revenue standpoint, concerts are number one by far, probably close to 50 to 55, maybe even 60% with then supporting events and then weddings coming in. So it's the exact opposite. It's more quantity, smaller revenue with weddings, but that's that's your bread and butter. That's what you're that's what you start doing and that's what you continue doing because it's such a great level of service. And then the other things, if you get the opportunity to do those, if you if you have the opportunity to get a contract with the university or with a large sports organization, then go for it because those will be highly high revenue streams, you're going to have to pay more in commission, but the high revenue streams allows you to uh, to do less for more and work harder than you ever have in your life. <laughs> yeah. Yes, absolutely. Would you say your margins on your weddings are better than your margins on your events, your large events? Not, not total dollar-wise, percentage-wise. Percentage-wise, I would say that the margins are better with the tailgating side of things, actually, because it's more of a service going to you. So the margins are typically typically at the very least around 100%, sometimes a little bit better than that. Weddings, we can get in the 30 to sometimes 40% profit margins, uh, depending on quality of service and what the customer is asking for. And then with festivals, festivals are high, but if you include the commissions, then it ends up being right around your uh, 18 to 20%. But 18 to 20% of a million dollar event is a great margin. Absolutely. Absolutely. You touched on this a couple of times. And I know that even as small and business owners, we are finding it tough to find good quality staff at the moment mm -hmm. for events. Now, at my largest, I had a roster of about a dozen people who would pick up regularly and consistently. So I didn't really need a large 30, 40 person roster because the 12 that I had wanted to be as full time as possible. Having said that, um, my baby business is nowhere near what your business is. And so how do you find the staff that you need to do what you need to do to support all of these contracts? 
So that's a uh, that's a good question. So our everyday small, I say small, our everyday sports contracts and our everyday weddings and, and our venue partnerships where we are obligated to do most of these quantity of events, we find those people just through your usual strands of doing your know, Facebook marketing and Instagram, uh, going through Indeed sometimes. Indeed's not the best, but I will say that the applications process on Facebook is not my favorite. I've gone through a lot of uh, different uh, application places and just for them to have the ability to say apply. And then all of a sudden they've applied without answering a single question is not my favorite because uh, it makes it more difficult for us to see if they're actually interested. So we have this whole online form of ours. Uh, our website's very intuitive where we can have conditional logic in our forms and whatnot. So if somebody says they want to work with us and they go and put out their availability, if they don't select at least two of the three available sections on from Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, it's not going to let them apply. It will push them to another application that says, would you like to be a contractor for us? And this kind of touches back on a previous episode you had about labor laws and employees versus 1099. So we got dinged on that pretty big. We actually faced uh, around $25,000 of fines for having contractors versus employees. So now all of our bartenders are employees. And then we do have bona fide bartender contractors from time to time for these larger shows. And they have, they're required to have business licensing, insurance, all that stuff. And, and once uh, we ask them if they can help us with something, then they would agree to do that. And you're very limited on what you can tell them to do and what not to do, what to wear, so on and so forth. So all that fun stuff. But if they don't meet those qualifications of what we set as our standard for them to work either Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, be available at least. They don't have to work those days. They just have to be available for us to schedule them. Then we push them over to be part of a, a contractor. So finding those people for our everyday type things is just those through those normal channels. And then from a larger standpoint, we have to get very strategic. We've done this the wrong way 20 times. And we, I think we finally figured it out last year. And the way we do it is we split up our entire staff into three different sources. So for a large festival, we typically need anywhere from 120 to 140 bodies. And so our full-time staff is all hands on deck. We have around 25 full-time staff that we that we bring in that are salary employees. Then we have to bring in all of the available part-time staff that we have that aren't working other events for our other obligations. Because while a festival is going on, we still have weddings and other things going on too. So then we bring those people in. And then we put in a, uh, a big push and a big marketing campaign online to ask for volunteers. And those volunteers will go through a similar type, uh, not necessarily an interview process, but more of an application process. And we will overstaff each section by about 40%. Because of that, we usually end up being right. But that usually means you have a 40% uh, amount of people that don't show up. And we learned that the hard way. So we have the volunteers and we have our, our staff, which is our staff is a small mix in it. And then we usually reach out to several nonprofit organizations to see if they have a crew that they want to bring in and all the tips that they make during that. Then they're able to keep for their organization. And we typically pitch in a few thousand dollars extra to help with their cause. And sometimes the concert does as well, because the concert also has benefactors that they like to contribute to. And then lastly is the expensive part, which is the staffing agency. So you reach out to several staffing agencies in that area. And they say, I can get 14 people, I can get 30 people. And then you have the big overzealous ones that say they can get 100 people and they're lying to you. So don't listen to them. But they, you, you let them kind of split up between them and then they, they, you negotiate the rates with them. And it'd be anywhere from 14 to $22 an hour, sometimes more in different states. And, um, and you pay it and you pay it. But they have somebody on site that's there, make sure people show up. And then, then you hopefully are staffed by being 40% overstaffed. You typically are just about staffed where you need to be for the big shows, which is a nightmare, a headache, and terrifying all at the same time. That's mind blowing. I would never have guessed 40% no show rate. That's wow. I have heartburn just thinking about 40% of my staff not showing up at a, at a given event, yeah. which it makes a ton of sense given your experiences over the past 14, 15 years as to why you have recently started thinking about expanding your network of mobile bars that you can tap into for event and contracts that you you get around the country. So um, if you wouldn't mind talking for a moment on, on what, what that network looks like, what it is, how it operates. Yeah, absolutely. So we have a contract with a tailgate company. Uh, they're a nationwide tailgate company. They were Founded in Alabama, actually, believe it or not. And then now they are in over, I think, over 50 different schools. They were had a, a big equity injection and then were actually acquired by that equity firm. And they are a massive company. Uh, we partnered with them young. We helped them with all of their tailgating at several SEC schools and other schools around the country. 
in 2019 is when that large expansion of that partnership happened. We then expanded to 13 states, got liquor licensing in all the states, hired staff in all the states, acquired buildings, brick and mortar, equipment, huge investment for us. And then 2020 happened. <laughs> so it was, uh, it, I mean, 20, the, the pandemic just about put us out of business. And if it wasn't for this box tail plan, then it, it definitely would have. It kept us afloat during the year and then, then along with some government assistance too. But we had to figure out, all right, coming into 2021, we can't do that again. That was not an equitable model. It was not something that we can survive on. So we started thinking, why, why should we go and insert ourselves into a market that there's already so many other people there. There's already people that have catering licenses or, or have just mobile staff or have the means to uh, to have their own equipment in places. So that way I'm not having to ship equipment across the country to do a 75 person tailgate. Why don't I just work with a local partner? And if we need to send equipment there, we send it to them. They use our equipment at the events. And then then when they're not, then they store it. And then we come pick it up in season, so on and so forth. So we found it to be a really good model to where we find a, a group of mobile bar companies that we're willing to work with. And once they meet our expectations and, and agree to go through all the paperwork that comes with it afterwards, then we uh, we get the events. We send it to them. They agree to do them. They go out, they do the events. There's some reporting on the back end. They have to take pictures, make sure that they're there. It's very similar to other processes, just because some clients may say you're there, some clients may say you're not. And yet you got to protect yourself and say, no, actually, here's here's the picture. They were there. So that's how our partner network works. And it will be expanded upon because we are getting several inquiries now in different states to do small festivals. We actually got an inquiry yesterday to do a uh, small festival, about a 10,000 person festival in Arkansas that we had to turn down because it's on April 9th and we're fully booked on April 9th. It's right around the corner. I don't think there's enough time to even get licensing for that. But we're having to turn down events because these areas, so we're building this network up so we can hopefully get more and more depth with that. And uh, we've we've named it the our ABC network. It's the Alliance of Beverage Caterers. And so anybody on here that would be interested in that, I'd be happy to give you the link to our site so you can possibly be a part of that, investigate it, see if it's something you want to do. Uh, you Obviously, it's not a franchisee type situation. You're not trying... I'm not trying to take a percentage of every bit the, of sales you do. I just have a, a large amount of events that I need to get fulfilled and maybe can help us do those. Yeah, I'll absolutely stick a link to that in the show notes for anybody who might be interested in reaching out to to you and your team to be a part of your ABC network. That's awesome. Yeah. So if you could tell somebody getting into festivals, one thing or two things that you wish someone had told you, what, what would that be? Um, my first thing would be is, are you serious? Because if you're serious, then you've got a lot of work to do. A lot of work. And, and it's not something to take on for the mild heart. This is something that you are going to spend three to six months of your life on. And then the second it's over, there's mountains and mountains of paperwork and reporting to do. The physical aspect of it, for our biggest show that we do, we spend nine days building it and three days tearing it down. That's just the beverage portion. There's a lot that goes to it. We, we have 15 people out there working day in and day out for those nine days. And, and it's it's a lot of heavy machinery work. It's, it's talking with people that are driving tractor trailers. It's coordinating ice. There's, there's so much operational to do. So make sure you're serious about it. And if you are serious about it, make sure you have the means to do it. A lot of these companies are going to require a check up front before you get the beer. And some may cash it and some may not. And then others are going to, you, in other situations, you're going to have to provide your own equipment. And some places, rarely, you'll be able to use equipment that maybe the distributor has. But you've also got to put on a good image for the festival that you're doing. So they're going to want to see nice faces that are going to go on the front sides of the tents that are going to be these nice menu style things that protect the bar and stuff like that. So uh, there's a lot, a lot to go into it. So if you're serious, get into it, put your money into it. And I say, the reason I say if you're serious is because you don't want to, you don't want to go buy all these things, do a festival and realize this isn't for me. Because unfortunately, festival equipment is not wedding equipment. You can kind of mask it some, but it's two completely different types of equipment. Uh, festivals and concerts are about speed, quality of service. Weddings are about mostly quality of service, less speed. So it's, it, it's just a complete polar opposite. So if you're serious, do it. If you're not serious, then just, just pass it up. It, it's a great idea. It sounds great. If you want to be a part of one, then great. But if you want to do an entire festival or an entire concert yourself, then stand by. It's going to be fun. I'm a, an equipment junkie. And you, you mentioned some festival equipment versus what I have favorite equipment. I have favorite equipment. Do you have a favorite piece of equipment that you utilize in festivals? Maybe it was life-changing when you got it, or it was just like a game changer. And if so, what, what is it? 
So that is a loaded question, but it changes every year because there's new ways of doing things. When it comes to a festival, if you're talking purely speed, horse troughs are going to be the fastest thing you can use. The giant 250, 300 gallon horse troughs, you can dump 40 cases of Bud Light, 16 ounce cans in there, stays ice cold. If you're smart, you'll put in a drain system into it. Otherwise, you're going to have 250 gallons of water you've got to dump. And not just 250 gallons. You, If you have one of those, if you have a, here's as an example, one bar may have 120 linear feet of bar space that you've got to figure out. So you may have 60 to 70 of those horse troughs there. If you don't want to do horse troughs, you can do igloos, 150 quart igloo coolers that you stack on top of each other. The first benefit of stacking them on top of each other is you don't have to bend down to pick up every single beer, which you've been down 600 times in a day. It's going to start hurting. But the second benefit is you have, you, you're have you double stacking your igloo. So the top igloo has all the beers you're using. When that's empty, then your barbacks pull it off and then put a new one underneath it. And the one that's below comes up and you start from that one. So it's a quick rotation system for you there. And then if we're talking, and it really depends on where the concert is, right? If we're in the middle of the field, those two first scenarios, great. If you are, if you have any opportunity to be on any sort of asphalt or concrete, and if you are, then bravo, you're lucky because most of the big concerts we do are in the middle of the field, mud and dirt and all kinds of fun stuff. But if you have the opportunity to be on asphalt or concrete, then all the IRP products are fantastic. The Arctics and the Super Arctics that can hold a ton of equipment, or a ton of product, uh, keep things chilled in a nice manner. Those are just great. If you do get the opportunity to have a reefer there, if you can talk to your distributor and they do have a reefer truck to keep all the beer cold, that helps and, and it helps uh, the amount of ice you're going to go through too. I would never, of all the things that I thought you were going to say, I definitely didn't think horse troughs and igloo coolers were going to be. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever heard, and you probably have, that's a silly question. You've heard of it. Have you ever utilized and what are your thoughts on the bottoms up system? You're talking about the draft system? Mm-hmm. I like it. It's great. If I was facilitating something at the at, at the Titan Stadium, right, and I could have something that's more stationary and could serve people, then absolutely a fantastic system. Putting it in the middle of a field and servicing 180 linear feet with it is a little bit more difficult. It could work. You're also talking about moving all this equipment around and moving the kegs. I try and stay away from draft beer as much as possible with these shows, believe it or not. You would think that you would want to stay with draft beer, but anytime you put draft beer in the middle of a field and it's been moving around, there's always going to be problems and we'll do it, but I don't want to do it to the masses. I'd much rather hand somebody a beer that's in a can than uh, yeah. opposed to doing a draft beer. But the bottoms yeah, up system absolutely. is great. I, it's it's really cool technology. Uh, it, it really does significantly reduce the foam and uh, allows you to have less waste too. Uh, the cups are expensive, but that's just the nature of the system. Yeah. Yeah. The cups are expensive, but because the little magnets at the bottom are customizable, you could almost get sponsors to like pay for the cups, I would think. Yeah. Um, I saw it at a uh, the beer fest here in Nashville a number of years ago. I geeked out so hard over it. Like I couldn't think of a reason for a mobile bar to need one because we don't serve enough beer to make it worthwhile. But I was like, yeah. man, if I was doing festivals, this might be a really uh, good technology. Not really thinking about the fact that, yeah, I mean, it's so much easier to do 120 feet of bar if you just have a bunch of coolers than to have like multiple systems set up throughout the bars. That makes sense. Yeah. And also the cost behind it too. Those those bottoms up systems are are not cheap. They're great. But like I said, if you're selling to a stadium or an arena, it's a fantastic product. Absolutely. Well, this was fun. Is there anything else that you that you want to share with our listeners in regards to the festivals? I mean, obviously we'll have you back and we'll talk about like sure. additional topics. Sure. The something that is important is money management on this, right? So you for a large thirty thousand person show that you may do two or three days on, or even even a one day show, you're going to need to have anywhere from eighty to one hundred one hundred twenty thousand dollars in change alone for this thing. So um, this huge investment, there is risk associated with cash being at a show. So we have like this uh, this command center we bought last year. I got a great deal on it, and we had to fix up some, but we put a safe on the inside of it, so we were able to. It's like a giant gun safe that we keep all the money in, and we have money counters on there, and, and we bring in bank staff from the local community to help count those things on site, and so on and so forth. But there's a huge aspect of that that is is money management, not only just counting the money, right, but making sure that. Each bar has enough money, making sure that your managers of each bar have a backpack on and that backpack has X number of thousands of dollars for change and also to take deposits because those registers are going to fill up so fast that you do not want that money. You don't want the 20 and hundreds 
section to be above where the uh, the breadth of, of the tray is. So you've got to uh, be diligent about that. And then when those come out, you, you obviously need to do money tracking. So you need to then have a Sharpie that goes into a Ziploc bag or some sort of like cigar bag or something like that, where you can write which POS it came from and keep up with all of it. So the money management system alone is, is, a, is a whole logistical process in itself. Yeah, you know, coming from the open bar, I mean, I do cash bars a couple times a year, but they're usually two or three bars. Not a big deal, right? Uh, I right. haven't even considered what it would look like to have $100,000 worth of with the cash floating around. And that's right. in addition to the POS systems, I'm assuming. Right. What POS system do you use and do you like it? Yeah, we have uh, we found most of our success with Square. We were with them since 2008, which I don't think they were a big thing at, in 2008. I think we started using them maybe in 2010. But anyway, we uh, started buying in their products. We own 40 of those units alone. But then when we have our big shows, we rent them through a company that Square licenses and they make it they make it fairly simple. You pay about anywhere from 70 to 90 dollars for this for the Square system each one and they ship it to you. They come in nice boxes and you repackage them in there, keeps everything safe. But then there's a we have an IT department that we have to bring on site that makes sure that all the devices are logged in the correct location, that all the menus are correct and that that you all everything's connected to Wi-Fi and that the Wi-Fi system that is with the festival, it doesn't interact with the emergency management system. So we've had that happen before where there's an EM, uh, emergency management message that goes out. It kills all Wi-Fi. It's designed to do that by nature. It's, it's supposed to do that. But if you're in the middle of a show and an emergency management message goes out, you lose sales for five minutes while the system reboots. And I mean, five minutes, you're, you're talking about $15,000 in five minutes, five to 10 minutes while it's rebooting. So it's a, uh, you, you got a lot of factors technologically wise that, that you've got to make sure that you're covered on. But the, the Square POS system has been great to us and the ability to rent them and not have to purchase all of them. I know there's several others out there like Best Ring and, and some others that we've used, but uh, I think we've been happiest with Square, just easy, ease of use and, and being able to, everybody knows it. They, they were kind of the pioneer in their industry and, and they've done a good job of updating their systems as time goes on. Thank you for making sure that we got that in there. Um, no small point. <laughs> that's a pretty yeah, important part of uh, festival management. Well, this has just been so awesome. Yeah, and thank you for having me. And, and, and one last thing I'd like to touch on just is like our staff, right? I can only do so much, but we have a dedicated team of 20 plus uh, full-time salaried employees that pour their heart and soul into this thing. And it is, uh, I, I'm nothing without them. And, and if you guys have the opportunity to hire full-time staff, then please do so because you will be able to grow so fast once you take that leap. And that's a big leap of faith you have to take. But once you do take that leap, then you will realize that your abilities to do things are kind of endless at that point. So our team is fantastic. Each person has their role, their responsibility. They work great together. There's bickering. It's a family, right? We're a big family and uh, and you have to treat it as such, but uh, it's it, we'd be nothing without them. So my, that was my last, last point to you on that. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. And that wraps up today's episode. I hope it was valuable. I would love to hear from you what you thought. You can drop me a line at hello at mobilebevpros.com or find me on Instagram at mobilebevpros. If you're looking for more valuable mobile bar related content, we have a website full of it. You can find us at www.mobilebevpros.com. And I'd love to see you in our Facebook community, also by the name of, you guessed it, Mobile Bev Pros. Thank you for joining me today. And until next time, cheers.